Let me welcome you all to today's tutorial on big brain anatomy for beginners. Uh, I want to start by saying that the brain is not only one of the body's most important organs, it's also the most complex one, okay? And in today's seminar, you will learn about the basic structures that make up the brain with a particular emphasis on what they look like in the big brain. Um, and, and this tutorial is geared towards, sci towards scientists with little or no knowledge about anatomy. Uh, so it really is for, for beginners. And I, the, the aim of the tutorial is to familiarize you with the landmarks used by anatomists to navigate through the brain and also the terms used to designate these landmarks. And, you know, to avoid just presenting you with a list of names, I um, also want to provide you with some relationship between uh, what these structures are and the functions that they are um, involved in. Why is it important to, to know about anatomy? Because this way we can um, understand uh, certain brain functions, okay? And obviously, it would have been much nicer to have been in Croatia right now. But while well, COVID has, um, yes, is, is a very, very stubborn little virus. So hopefully, by the next Big Brain meeting, we'll be able to have a, an in-person meeting. If you have any questions anytime throughout the lecture, please um, feel free to to interrupt me and, um, you know, if you put your hand up, then I, I'll see it down here, okay? So, let's start. Um, I'd like to uh, start by introducing the terms that anatomists use to define relative locations of, of brain structures. And, um, and here you will see something that, that unfortunately is, makes life for, for medical students difficult, and that is that anatomists often use different terms to describe um, the same structure, okay? So, um, you know, we have the term superior, dorsal, or inferior, basal, or ventral. They um, are used to, to designate, you know, the top or the bottom of the brain relative to its position um, in the skull. And to make life just that bit more complicated, uh, you must know that the brain has two, um, or the human brain, and, and that of, of, of hominoid primates, has uh, two axes, okay? Now, um, one of them is the one that's um, highlighted here by the, the red uh, arrows. It's the so-called Forel's axis, and it's the, the long axis of the brain. And the blue one is Maynard's axis, and it's the one that we use um, for the brain stem and the spinal cord. And since today I won't be talking about the brain stem or the spinal cord, anytime I talk about, you know, anterior, posterior, I will be referring to the longitudinal axis of the, of the forebrain. Um, these two axes, they are slightly different just simply when we talk about uh, what is like uh, in front of or behind, because when we're talking about the brain, we would talk about anterior for something that's, you know, in front of us, in front of our nose. But if we were in the brain stem, we'd be talking about the ventral direction when we were when we want to refer to a structure that is located uh, in the brain stem or the spinal cord at, at the side, you know, that's closest to our to our nose. Um, and then once I've mentioned these major. Um, um, terms that we use for a global orientation. The next um, term that I'd like to introduce is that of the planes of sectioning. And what you here see are um, three uh, sections 
through the big brain as displayed by the multi-level brain atlas, which is hosted um, on the eBrains platform. And you can see the different names of these planes of sectioning, okay? So we have the coronal or frontal plane, which divides the brain into uh, rostral and caudal portions or anterior and posterior. We've got the sagittal plane, which divides the brain into left and right parts. And if the section that you're looking at is located very close to the midline of the brain, and it splits it into really the two halves, uh, and that is what you, what you can see more or less in this image here, we talk about a mid-sagittal um, location of, of the section. And if we've got a, a sagittal section that is very close to either the, you know, the external left or right side of our brain, then we talk about a um, parasagittal location, okay? And then the third uh, plane of sectioning that you will hear me talk about is the horizontal one. And uh, that one divides the brain into dorsal and ventral uh, portions, so up and um, down. And you're probably all familiar with this version of, of Big Brain, you know, those of you that are already working with it, because you're working with, with sections. But um, before uh, I go into more detail about this, I'd like to introduce you to, to Big Brain when it was, let's say, young. So before it was sectioned and what it looked like before um, it underwent the sectioning and the staining and the reconstruction and everything that is needed to, upstate, to obtain this, this really impressive um, data set. So what you here see are photographs of the lateral surfaces of big brain and um, it came from a 65 year old male donor and was or is uh, almost 1400 grams in weight which basically makes it an average um, size and weight uh, because it was from, from, so from front to back, it's approx approximately 16 centimeters um, long. And sectioning this brain into uh, the 20 micrometer sections, um, which were used to, to create the, the atlas, uh, resulted in the grand total of, of approximately 7,000 um, sections. Now, I'm going to zoom in to two of these views here, just so that you can see structures with a bit more detail. And if we concentrate just here on the left hemisphere or on the, the, the basal surface of the brain, so that is the view of the big brain from below, as if you were you know, looking at it from, um, from your chest upwards, what you can see is that, um, the surface of the brain, it isn't smooth, it is convoluted. And there are two different parts of the brain with different degrees of, of convolution, okay, of, of folding. We've got uh, this part, which is now highlighted in blue with a very, very tight folding. That is the cerebellum. And in red, we have the forebrain with a uh, much um, lower degree of folding. And then highlighted in green, we've got the brain stem, which basically doesn't have any folding. Okay. Um, and this part here, just at the very right of the slide, that would be the beginning of the spinal cord. And the brain stem enables the transfer of information between the brain and the body, and it also contains groups of neurons which are involved in the control of automatic functions such as our heartbeat and our breathing. And the cerebellum, I'm not going to talk really much about it today, um, apart from the fact to say that it is 
plays a really important role in the in uh, maintenance of, of balance and uh, motor control and um, also in the control of voluntary motor skills. So on the one hand, you know, when you're standing up, your certain muscles have to be relaxed and other muscles have to be tense for you to be able to stand up and not just, you know, collapse like a heap in the ground. You, you don't have to concentrate though to keep those muscles that, that help you keep your upright position. You don't have to keep on thinking about, oh, I've got to, you know, keep the, my, my lower back muscles contracted and so on and so forth, okay? That is something that happens automatically and that is something that the cerebellum deals with. But the cerebellum also deals with fine tuning, um, for example, whenever you want to, to uh, hold uh, a pencil or, or hold a glass and, and it helps you um, control your muscles so that you, your grip on the glass is strong enough so that it doesn't slip out of your hand, but also not too strong because you wouldn't want to crack this uh, glass, right? And I'll go into you know, more detail about the different functions that the forebrain is involved in, in later on during, during the talk. Um, right, so just to remind you, brainstem enables the transfer of information between the brain and the body, and, and uh, the cerebellum uh, plays a, a really important role in motor skills. Now, uh, since we know that the cerebellum, and this is something that we know because you, like you see it whenever you take the brain out of, of the skull, we know that the cerebellum is located at the towards the back of the brain. And we also know that it is located below um, the forebrain. So that helps us to very easily identify the hemispheres that we're looking at. So which half of the brain we're looking at and also to see which is the front and which is the back of the brain, right? So because we can see the cerebellum is here underneath the forebrain, then we know that this is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain. And again, from this basal view, we would have the front and the back of the brain. And then we would know that this is the left hemisphere and this is the right hemisphere, okay? And um, they are separated, the, sem uh, the hemispheres are uh, separated by the interhemispheric uh, fissure. And what you can here see is that there are certain structures in the brain that are paired structures. So we have two hemispheres uh, in the forebrain, we have two hemispheres in the cerebellum. This means, for example, that although anatomists talk about um, for example, the hippocampus as a brain structure uh, that is uh, plays a really important role in learning and memory uh, functions. The brain doesn't have one hippocampus, it has two hippocampi, one in each hemisphere, okay? Now, let me see. Uh, let's just... Um, bring a bit of interaction into this because otherwise it's terribly boring if it's only me talking all the time and, and you having to listen. Um, give me a hands up if um, you think that the asterisk that I've placed here at the very far right of the image, if I've placed it at the front of the brain. So you can use the, yes, I see hands coming up. Very nice, loads of hands coming up, that's nice. Now, tell me something. Do you think that this hemisphere that I'm showing, is it a left hemisphere? Either leave your hands up or take them down if you think that, oh yes, all hands are disappearing, very good. So yes, what you see here is a right, the right hemisphere of the big brain. And, and the asterisk is in front. Okay, 
So um, back to the views of the brain, only I've changed, or sort of big brain, only now instead of uh, showing you the basal view uh, on the right side of the slide, I am showing the view of, of big brain um, from above, because um, here it is clearer to see that both hemispheres are separated by a groove, which we call the longitudinal fissure, okay? Now, I'd mentioned before that the surface of the brain is, is convoluted, that we've got foldings uh, or we've got folds. And um, each one of the folds is um, separated by uh, grooves, okay? So we've got the, the bumps or, fo or folds, and that's what uh, is called a gyrus singular, one gyrus or uh, several gyri. And uh, these bumps are separated by grooves or they're also called sulcus or sulci for, for plural. Now, if we've got sulci which are particularly deep and prominent, then they receive the name fissure. And in the brain, there are actually only two of these grooves which, um, which receive this name fissure. One of them is the longitudinal fissure separating both hemispheres. And the other one is this sulcus that you see here on the lateral side of the brain. This is the so-called lateral fissure, okay? So from here, you can see that we don't just say, oh, this sulcus here at the front or this gyrus here at the back, but that individual sulci and also individual gyri receive um, names. And um, these two images here uh, provide um, a color coding of the main sulci in the brain and uh, their respective names. This image here isn't of the big brain. It's uh, the image of the uh, Colin 27 brain, which is the single subject template brain in MNI space. And you know, don't worry, I'm not going to, to ask you to learn all of these uh, names, um, and, I, and I don't expect you either to be able to identify all of these sulci. Um, but I just want to highlight a couple of important ones because they will um, help me then um, make a couple of the points that I want to that I want to discuss with you um, today. So back to the dorsal. Um, view of the big brain and, and the orientation of the image is such that the front of the brain is to the left of the image and the back of the brain is to the um, left of the image and then we've got left and right um, on the bottom and top of the image. And um, What I've highlighted here in red and blue is the course of the central and the precentral um, sulcus on the two hemispheres of big brain, right? And what you can see here is that um, it's the same brain, in, but the course of these sulci isn't identical on both hemispheres of the brain. So that gives you an idea of the variability of sulcal patterns. So there are certain sulci that are present in all brains, for example, the central and the precentral sulcus, and also the lateral fissure. They're present in all brains, but um, there are certain degrees of variability. So for example, the precentral sulcus uh, on the right side of the big brain is what we call continuous because you can follow it down from the beginning to, to the end. Um, whereas on the left hemisphere, it's uh, what anatomists called interrupted. And that's what's indicated here by the fact that I've 
that I've shown it in two segments. Okay, that's that's what we what we talk about. Um, and then, for example, here uh, we've got a, a bifurcation close to the longitudinal fissure on the right hemisphere, but not on the left hemisphere. So some sulci have a more a constant pattern across brains and other ones have a more variable pattern amongst brains. And this just makes their identification um, that bit more difficult um, for anatomists. Now, um, if you look at these three uh, brains here, and I tell you that, well, one of them is the big brain and the other two aren't the big brains. Um, could you tell me now, which one of these brains do you think is big brain? Would it be A or B or C? So if you could put it into the chat, let's see, let's see what people think. Yes, there's an A and there's an A, very good. Oh, everybody's saying A, nice. There's a little B there. No, but it wasn't. Okay, A, A, very good. So, and another A, thank you. Um, it is brain A. A brain A is, is the big brain. But what you can see here is this um, variability, right? And, and our circle pattern is so personal that uh, no two people in the entire world have exactly the same circle pattern, right? So, so, so the folding pattern is in your brain of your brain is as individual as your um, uh, fingerprint, and not even monozygotic twins. And you must know that monozygotic twins they have they share one hundred percent of their DNA, not even they have the same folding pattern um, in their brain, okay? Right, so now let me come back to the big brain. And what you here see is on the left, we've still got the left hemisphere of the big brain. And on the right side, what I've got is a surface reconstruction of the big brain, and this was created by Claude Lepage at, um, at the MNI. Thanks, Claude, for, for uh, providing me with this data set. Um, I've had to, to um, use a surface reconstruction of the big brain because it was processed entirely, right? So there is no way of taking a photograph of the medial surface, that is the surface that is located within the longitudinal fissure, okay, in, in the brain. And um, I've highlighted a couple of sulci that I want to discuss with you in detail today because they separate functional domains um, in the brain. And I've also highlighted a structure here that is visible in the medial um, surface of the brain, the so-called corpus callosum, and it is a nerve tract which connects the left and right hemispheres, and it enables communication between both sides of, of the brain, right? And I've highlighted the central sulcus in red, and you can see that the central sulcus isn't just located on the lateral surface of the brain, although that's where it you know, the longest part of the sulcus is found, but we can also see a little bit of the central sulcus on the medial surface of, of the brain, right? And um, we've got the lateral fissure in black, the parietal occipital sulcus in blue, uh, the cingulate sulcus in green, and the calcarine sulcus in yellow. And the central sulcus, it serves as a macroscopic landmark to set the boundary between the frontal and the parietal lobes, which I've highlighted in blue and in green. 
And um, okay. Um, on the medial, oh, on the medial surface of the brain, some anatomists identify the limbic lobe. Other people. Um, Categorize like this rostral part of the of um, the limbic lobe to the frontal lobe and this uh, posterior part to the parietal lobe and this inferior part to the temporal lobe. Um, you will see that the um, parietal occipital lobe on the medial surface of the brain it serves as a macro anatomic landmark to separate the occipital and the parietal lobes, right? Um, but on the lateral surface of the brain, we don't have uh, a clear landmark separating these two lobes. And um, there isn't a clear macroscopic landmark either, uh, which, which helps us identify the border between the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. So at times, um, these borders can be set in a more or less random manner, okay? Now, why is it important for us to identify frontal, occipital, or temporal lobes? That is because they are involved in uh, different functions, right? So we know, for example, that the frontal lobe is associated with what is what are called higher level cognition um, uh, or cognitive functions. So for example, it enables us to um, predict the consequences of our actions and it also enables us to suppress socially inappropriate behavior. It's also crucial for our ability to produce what's called expressive language. So, you know, to talk what I'm doing right now. And the posterior part of the frontal lobe, so the part of the frontal lobe that is closest to the central sulcus, it contains the primary motor cortex, which is the part of the brain which enables us to carry out body movements, right? And um, the parietal lobe, for example, is really important for the interpretation of touch, particularly the part of the parietal lobe that is located here, close to the central um, sulcus. And then when we move uh, backwards in the parietal um, sulcus, what we find are um, so-called associative areas because they integrate um, information from different modalities. So for example, they integrate information that we receive, receive from the visual system and information that we receive from, from the somatosensory, so the touch system. And um, that enables us to control our movements when we are carrying out reaching and grasping movements. So again, for example, you know, you want to grasp a, a glass. Um, and then afterwards, you want to be able to bring that grass, glass to your mouth and not, you know, up to your ear or so on, because you want to, you want to drink it, okay? It's also the part of the brain that helps you park your car smoothly, or um, the part of your brain that um, uh, um, enables you to carry out uh, mathematical um, uh, functions and, and, and understand differences between uh, numbers. So it plays a role in the knowledge of numbers and their relationships, okay? Um, the occipital lobe, so the one here at the back of the brain, is what we would call the visual processing center. Uh, it really enables us to perceive and uh, process uh, light intensity, color, 
movement. Um, it contains areas that are specifically activated when you recognize faces, uh, faces sorry, versus other areas that are activated when you are observing places. And um, it's not only that, that you can recognize you know, faces, but it also distinguishes between faces of people that you know versus faces of people that you've never seen before, okay? Um, it also contains uh, an area which is the so-called word recognition area, which of course is really important um, for reading. The um, temporal lobe uh, contains the primary auditory cortex. The primary auditory cortex is uh, within the temporal lobe, but buried in the depths of the, of the lateral um, fissure. So of course, this part of the brain is crucial for the perception and uh, interpretation of sounds um, in, in, in general. And it is also particularly important. So these, this part of the temporal lobe that is located closer to the occipital lobe and also um, then at the interface with the parietal lobe, it uh, is particularly important for language comprehension. And then the limbic lobe, why it's important, I think, uh, to, to distinguish this as a separate lobe is uh, because it, it contains parts of the brain that are from the evolutionary point of view, the oldest ones. And I will go into a bit more detail on this later on in the talk. And um, it plays a really important role in the processing of um, emotions. And it is also the part of the brain where the hippocampus is located. So the structure that I told you, uh, or I mentioned earlier on, and I said that it was really important for learning and um, memory processes, okay? So just a short recap of, of what um, I've been talking about up to now. I've mentioned global orientation uh, landmarks in the brain and also the different planes of sectioning, the horizontal, coronal, sagittal planes of sectioning, um, which are the, the so-called classical and standard um, planes of sectioning. I have mentioned the major parts of the brain, and, and I hope I've also made clear that uh, some sulci can be used as macroanatomical landmarks to identify functionally relevant um, um, structures in the brain, but this is not always the case, okay? So, um, so this is an important lesson that anatomists have learned then basically throughout, throughout the decades. And um, also uh, that there is a, a relationship between these major uh, subdivisions, so the lobes into which uh, the brain can be divided and functional domains. Um, now, this doesn't mean that, that, um, that only the occipital lobe is involved in visually related uh, tasks, okay? Because, for example, in the frontal lobe, we have a part of the brain which is called the frontal eye field, frontal because it's in the front frontal lobe, but I feel because it's also associated with um, eye movements and with um, how we move our, our eyes to be able to detect uh, different relevant points um, in, in the scenes that, that we are confronted with each time to be able to gather as much information as possible um, from what surrounds us. Um, now, now I would like to finish this first block, which would deal with the so-called macroanatomy um, of, of the big brain. And I would like to go into 
the micro anatomy. So what you would see if you were basically looking through a microscope. And I'd just like to um, remind you or tell you that um, the brain is uh, basically composed of two main kinds of cells, the neurons and the glial cells, okay? And then of course, we also have blood vessels and uh, just the same as any other organ in the brain, uh, uh, sorry, in the body, the brain is also covered by epithel. So by, by um, well, a sort of a, call it a, a skin. And the basic difference between neurons and glial cells is that neurons are able to produce and propagate electrical impulses. So that's what action potentials are, okay? These are the electrical impulses which enable the transfer of um, signal within uh, the cell. Neurons can do this and glial cells can't do this. So that's why neurons are the only cells um, within the brain which are actively implicated in um, signal transfer, right? And thus they can enable brain functions. And glial, glial cells, their name comes from the Greek word for glue. And originally, uh, it was thought that they were only involved in the, uh, they, they were basically only served to hold neurons together uh, in place in the brain and that they would act as, as supportive cells. And they would also insulate the axon from the extracellular fluid. And that way they would um, support um, or, or the speedy transfer of the action potentials. And that is what's indicated by this uh, schematic representation here on the right. So this, um, the thin lines that you see here would be like the contours of a neuron. And you can see uh, the, the, the neuron has a cell body. It has so-called dendrites. Then it has a very long axon and uh, synapses, what you here see, what you see here um, are so-called collaterals of, of the axon. So there are some like side branches of the axon. And these thick black lines here would indicate glial cells, which are wrapped round um, the axon and this way, as I said, insulated from the extracellular fluid. So they would be creating the myelin sheath um, that covers the axons, right? And this is what people thought in the, in the past, that that was the only role that glial cells had. But nowadays we know that glial cells are also um, involved in uh, supplying um, food and oxygen to nutrients that they control. Um, the, um, they are able to modulate brain function because they can also um, control the, the amount of neurotransmitters which are in the extracellular space. And neurotransmitters are the molecules that um, neurons release to communicate with each other. So within the neuron, signal is transferred via action potentials, but then when one neuron wants to talk to another neuron, it releases a neurotransmitter, um, which then transfers this information to uh, the neighboring neuron, okay? And we also know that glial cells are involved in, uh, they, they're able to destroy pathogens and, and remove um, dead neurons from the brain. So they have a, a protective function. Now, if I show you a, uh, a section through the brain, I'm sorry, 
If I throw, show you a section through the big brain, and that's what you see here, um, this section was taken approximately from um, the level of big brain indicated by this black line. And what I've done here is that the blue line uh, encompasses the part of the section that belongs to the frontal lobe and the yellow lines, uh, they encompass the part of the brain that um, belong to the temporal lobe, okay? And what you can see here is that um, the gray values uh, of this image, they um, are not um, equally distributed throughout the image. And we, we have gray values because this section of big brain was stained with a silver cell body staining um, method, okay? And um, what we have is a, a stripe of, of gray, which surrounds the hemispheres and which can vary in, in thickness, so between three and five millimeters, depending on where we are, right? Uh, this is what we call the cortex. And then we also have, um, and, and it's gray matter. We call it gray matter and we call it cortex, okay? And then we have uh, also, so a darkly um, gray stained um, structure down here, like in the center of the brain. This is also gray matter, but um, because it's not on the surface of the brain, we call it a subcortical um, structure. And then, between the cortex and the subcortical, subcortical structures, we've got what is called white matter, okay? And um, how do these differences um, happen in the brain? These differences between gray and white matter um, happen because uh, neurons um, and glial cells aren't equally distributed throughout the brain. And basically the cell body and the dendrites and also the synaptic terminals of neurons are located within the gray matter, right? And this gray matter can be either in the cortex or in the subcortical structures, but axons um, of cells that connect these different parts of the brain and these axons, they're the ones that have the myelin sheath that I was talking about, they're located within the white matter, okay? So the cell bodies of neurons are mainly located within gray matter, okay? With a few exceptions, which I won't go into today because that would be too much detail. But what you can see here is that, um, if you know that these dark lines here represent glial cells, then the cell bodies of glial cells, they would be here located in the white matter, right? So this tells you then that um, the, there's a diff, the, the, the distribution of glial cells varies depending on what part of the brain we, we are looking at, okay? And um, if you look at classical study or classical neuroanatomical um, books, like for example, the Candel, which is, you know, uh, um, um, it's called uh, uh, Basic Principles of, of Neuroscience, and it was written by a Nobel Prize winner. When you sort of like think, if they say that um, the brain has, uh, you know, 50 times more glial cells than neurons, well, you, you would believe it, right? But don't believe it because it's not true. And uh, this, these more recent studies by the group of uh, Susanna Herculano Rusel, what they did was quantify uh, the proportion of glial cells to neurons in different parts of the brain. And what they found was that if you look just at, it, at the entire brain, all of it together, we basically have the same number of glial cells 
as of uh, neurons, okay? But if you break the brain down into its different components, so for example, if you look at the, the forebrain, so the cortex and the subcortical um, um, structures, and you separate that from the cerebellum and from the brainstem, then you can see that the proportions vary, okay? So, um, for example, we have in the, um, in the cerebral cortex, we have four times more glial cells than neurons. Um, and that is because glial cells, um, as I said before, they have more functions than just creating a myelin sheath. And um, they're really, really important uh, for the neurons to provide them with nutrients and with, with oxygen, right? So now we go back to the coronal section and I've highlighted what we call cortex with these um, red lines and I've highlighted um, subcortical nuclei that we can see here in green. And just so that you know it, because I'm not going to discuss it anymore today, but, but these structures um, are important um, for brain function and um, and I know that there are currently um, several uh, research projects dealing with their mapping. So we have, for example, the caudate nucleus, the um, putamen, which would be this part here. We've got the nucleus accumbens and we've got the claustrum. Now, for example, for those of you that that are looking for or, or dealing with, with automatic ways of, of segmenting the brain. It is quite easy to separate the white matter from the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the nucleus accumbens, because the, 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 these, these nuclei are, are very compact and, and the contrast in staining intensity is very strong. So that's relatively easy to do. The claustrum, for example, provide is, is much more difficult to do because, uh, well, the differences in gray levels are much um, uh, smaller because it has a much tighter relationship with the cortex. And this is led, for example, in MR uh, images. It has led to people trying to automatically um, measure cortical thickness to provide very incorrect values for this part of the brain here, which is the insular cortex, because this, these automatic segmentation procedures were not, allowed, were not able to separate the cortex of the insula from the claustrum, which is a subcortical gray matter substance. Okay, so they, they measured um, they said the cortical thickness that they gave for the insula was actually a thickness which encompassed the cortex of the insula plus the claustrum. So that would be really nice, for example, if somebody could find a, 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 a way of um, automatically um, segmenting this because uh, this is, these are things that the anatomists that we try to do um, at our institute all the time. It's, 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 uh, we try and find strategies by which we can mathematically validate borders that we can detect by visual inspection. Okay. Um, right. Um, this was just a, a anatomy, the caudate nucleus and the putamen are grouped together in a structure which is called striatum. And then the, these three nuclei together, they form what are called the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia together with the cerebellum uh, play this really important role in, in um, motor control. Now, I'd... Um, mentioned that neurons aren't homogeneously distributed throughout the brain. And I'd said that we find the cell bodies of neurons in the gray matter. 
of the brain. And when we're looking at the cortex, um, we can find a further differentiation in the way these cell bodies are distributed, okay? And that is within the cortex, cell bodies are arranged in horizontal layers. So with horizontal, I mean that these layers are parallel to the brain surface, okay? And um, in the human brain, the greatest part of the cortex uh, is what we call neocortex or isocortex. So these two words, um, they refer to exactly the same part of the brain, right? And um, it's called neocortex because, because it is the part of the, of the cortex that, is the, that has appeared you know, throughout evolution um, most recently. And the mesocortex or, uh, and the allocortex, those are old cortical structures. So they were already present very early on um, in evolution. This means that very um, primitive animals with a very poorly differentiated brain, they have the proportion of neocortex relative to allocortex is um, very small. Whereas in the human brain, most of our brain surface is occupied by neocortex. Okay. And um, in within the isocortex, we distinguish um, basically six cortical layers, which are designated by um, Roman numerals. And uh, you, we can distinguish these um, layers based on um, mapping criteria which have been developed um, you know, throughout the years by um, neuroanatomists. Okay, so the criteria that, that are used are, and I'm basically going from the most important and most relevant criterion that we use to, to the least one. That's what um, this, this uh, list shows here. Basically, we've got the, the laminar distribution um, of, of how densely packed cells are when we're moving from the surface of the brain, that would be here at the top of the image, to the border between the cortex and the white matter, that would be at the bottom of the image. Um, we also distinguish the absolute thickness of cortical layers, but not just that, also the relative thickness. So in, in some cortical areas, we talk about a very, very thick um, layer three, but we also say uh, in, in some areas, layer three is wider than layer five, whereas in other areas, layer five is wider than layer three, or um, layer five has a higher cell packing density, than, packing density than layer three, or vice versa. Um, in some areas, the borders between these cortical layers are very easy to see. In other areas, there is a like a smoother transition between cortical layers. Um, in some areas, you can see that um, these the, the cells that build the layer are, are equally distributed throughout the layer, whereas in other areas, uh, we've got so-called um, you know, little groups of cells, so there are clusters of cells, and um, if these clusters of cells fall, uh, um, follow like very um, columnar arrangements, we, we talk about, believe it or not, anatomists can be like romantic, we talk about raindrops in the brain. Um, uh, and the other important criterion that we use uh, for brain mapping is the presence of special types of cells, such as BET cells, which I will introduce to you in a second, or, or minor cells, okay? Now, um, what you see here are 
two different sections through the big brain at two different rostral caudal levels. So the image on the left side of the brain is through the um, occipital pole and um, the image here on the right side is um, it's basically located at the interface between the parietal and the frontal lobe, okay? So at the level of the central sulcus. And the central sulcus would be this sulcus that, that you can see here, right? And these images, these are, these show these 20 micrometer resolution images that are now available for the big brain. But I know that Timo and his team are working on um, enabling you to also see the high resolution images. Um, so the one micrometer resolution version of these images here. And that is something that, that they hope to have implemented like uh, within the near future. But um, until that happens, I'm going to have to just use a little trick to show you the points that I want to make in, in the next image. And what I'm going to do is I want to show you the site architecture of this part of the brain here within the primary, um, uh, within the central sulcus. I want to show you this would be the primary motor cortex. And I want to show you a detailed view of the site architecture within the calcarin um, sulcus and that is the primary visual cortex, okay? And if you compare these two images here, I hope that, you know, even if you've never looked at a cell body staining um, with a microscopic resolution in the past, I hope you can see that there is a difference in the, in the laminar distribution pattern that you can see in these two images so that you do get an impression of um, a more complex uh, lamination here in the primary visual cortex than you do in the primary motor cortex. So, so you can see layers here um, in the primary visual cortex. Maybe you can't identify all of them, but you can see that it does look, you know, that, that it seems to be, or the changes seem to be smoother in the primary motor cortex. And I also hope that you can see that the primary motor cortex contains some really large cells, which I've highlighted with the red arrows. And um, that if you look in layer 5B uh, in the primary visual cortex, well, primary visual cortex um, doesn't have a division of layer 5 into 5A and 5B, but if you look uh, in layer five of the primary visual cortex, you don't see any position that strikes you as, oh, I think there are some really big cells there, just as the ones that we find here in the primary motor cortex, okay? So these are these differences that I was mentioning before in the degree of lamination of areas and the presence of special cells, because these cells are the BETS cells, okay? And the BETS cells, they are really, really um, uh, interesting. They are by far the largest cells in the, in the mammalian brain or the primate brain, okay? And their cell body can be up to 100 micrometers in diameter. And then their axon um, uh, can be up to one meter long. And that is, because BET cells, so they're located up here in your central sulcus, in the primary motor cortex, and then they are um, axons, they run through the white matter into the brain stem, down your spinal cord, um, as far as, um, well, you know, say your waist or a bit lower down, and that's why they've got this really long axon. And within the spinal cords, BET cells make a synaptic contact with uh, a second neuron, which is called an alpha motor neuron, 
which then directly connects with your muscles, okay? So this is what we've got, what is, what is called a monosynaptic, because there's only one synapse connecting uh, your primary motor cortex and your muscles. So there's only one synapse in that path telling you to either um, relax a muscle or um, contract, uh, um, um, yes, um, God, what's the, what's the contract that the, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the word of, of the opposite of, of relax. Anyway, you, I hope, know what I mean. Um, the reason why the cell body of bed cells is so big is because it has to have loads and loads of so-called mitochondria, which are the energy producing organs within um, the cell body. And, and then all of this energy and, you know, that needs to be uh, used to transport the signal um, along this very long axon. Okay. Now, differences in layers. On the right of the image, on the left of the image, sorry, you see the primary visual cortex, and I already showed you an image of what the site architecture of the primary visual cortex um, looked, uh, looks like. And on the right of the image, you uh, see the site architecture of uh, V2, so secondary visual cortex. And I hope that also for those of you that are not, um, that are not uh, um, like, you know, used to looking at this kind of images, you can see that there's a difference in the, in the degree of, 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 of how complex the laminar pattern is um, within V1 as compared to V2, okay? And, and how this is why we can identify the border between these two areas. And this border would be like if you imagine a line connecting these two arrowheads. OK. Um, so, for example, this layer um, 6A that we have here, which is really darkly stained in V1, it's no longer that darkly stained in V2 and, you know, so on and, and so forth. Um, so the primary visual cortex is a primary area. So it's the first part of the brain where we become aware of the fact that we have seen something. And that is the same as the primary somatosensory cortex is the first part of the brain where we bec become aware of the fact that we can, uh, we've sensed something. Um, and the problem is that whenever we move in the brain up to uh, the so-called association areas, it becomes more and more difficult to identify cortical borders. So basically, um, you just have to believe me because it also, you just have to believe me when I say that the border between uh, Brodmann area 46 and frontal polar area one is located here uh, at the position indicated by these two arrowheads. And because this requires a, a quite a high degree of expertise, um, Carl Zillis and Catherine Amons worked for years to establish a quantitative and statistically testable um, approach to cytoarchitectonic mapping. Um, this was all done in two dimensions, um, and it was done based on a quantitation of, of the gray level index, which um, gives us an idea of the proportion of cell bodies uh, in the cortex with relation to the other um, uh, parts of, of uh, cells in the cortex. Um, but the important thing, for example, in big brain would be to be able to do this in three dimensions. And um, Conrad has already, uh, uh, you know, taken an impressive step forward in doing this and has created the first whole brain a quantitative quantitative 3D laminar um, atlas, which is really, really good in 
most parts of the brain. Um, still needs refining in um, some parts of the brain and um, mainly the parts of the brain where it needs refining is uh, the parts of the brain where also neuroanatomists would often have problems in identifying these borders. So this is another challenge, challenge <clears throat> you know, for people working with, with for example, deep learning algorithms, 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 sorry, and so on. Now, what I'd like to do is just um, in the last couple of minutes that, that I've got, I'd like to give you a couple of tips on when you're in the big brain, how to find um, cortical structures, okay? So for example, how would you find the central sulcus if you've got a section um, in, the, in the big brain? And um, anatomists have found uh, several tricks uh, by which this uh, can be done. And the first trick that was found was the omega sign. Um, and um, what they saw was that when you're looking at the central sulcus, uh, the hand knob area, so the part of the central sulcus where the hand representation is, it always uh, had a shape that reminded the anatomists of an omega sign, okay? And um, then um, we have in the coronal uh, plane of view, what the anatomists called the handball representation. So you've got to imagine that this gyrus here would be the hand and this gyrus here would be the ball. So it takes a bit of imagination. And when you've got the sagittal um, plane of, of sectioning, the, the anatomists use the so-called two hands um, rule. Again, you've got to use a bit of imagination. And um, that would help you indicate when you see these, these crossing lines here, that would help you indicate the position here in the brain of where the central sulcus is, and then you could follow um, that down in the brain. Okay. Um, right. And with this, I would like to finish my presentation. If you've got any questions, you know, I'll be here, or you've got my email address, you can send me a question, there's no problem at all. Susanna, should I hand over to you now? Yeah, thanks a lot, Nicola. Are there a any pleasure. questions from the audience? That seems not to be the case. Okay. Um, so I, I just look in the chat. Oh, there's one way. There is, there is. Oh, there are. Yes. Oh, dear. Plenty. Okay, so go ahead. So just maybe one question that uh, goes right into like this last slide you just showed, like these hand yeah. signs, would they work with the uh, tremendous kind of like variability between people in the in the so-called so -called patterns? Is this something you can easily see or is this really an expert kind of thing as well? No, 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 no. This, this, these um, hand with ball, two hand and omega sign, mm -hmm. they are um, universal. For okay but it's the central sulcus so it is it is the sulcus or one of the sulci that is you know the easiest to to identify uh, this sulcus which you can see which you can see here which is really really deep because it's the biggest one well that would be the the lateral fissure it's also easy to identify so what one has to do is identify the the, the sulci which are easy to find and then you sort of like work your way just the same as you would do when you're navigating in a town you know a couple of major landmarks and then you work your way around that right okay cool thanks <laughs> a pleasure um uh timo yes yeah oh yes well timo i don't know if anybody else is excited about the fact that we'll soon be able to have the one micron images online but i am definitely excited about this <laughs> 
and I don't know what contract means. No, I meant con oh, oh, contract. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, we're talking about muscle and flex. Yes, thank you so much. You see, this is the kind of thing that if we weren't virtual, if we'd been in the same room, you would have just been able to say flex, you know, and, and but anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, any questions, anything you need, just send me an email.